When you hear Aquatic Invasive Species, or AIS, many people automatically think Asian carp, but they're only part of the problem, a problem that costs taxpayers and industries billions of dollars. There's no end in sight. I think of aquatic invasive species as a form of pollution. It's harmful to the environment and it's harmful to our economy and human health. It is a very complex issue because we're not just talking about critters in a bucket of water. There's lots of talk about the Asian carp moving into Lake Michigan, but this is not a new story. It's just the next chapter in the century-long biological plunder on the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory reports more than 180 aquatic plants and animals that shouldn't be here. Species like Phragmites, the Asian water milfoil, the spiny water flea, and a fish-killing virus called VHS. We have zero examples of eradication, actually, of aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes, and we can control precisely two. Those two species under control? the alewife and the sea lamprey. We've spent many decades fighting the lamprey as it destroyed most of the native lake trout. What we had was a decay, really, of the whole um, fabric of the Great Lakes uh, fishery, largely because of the sea lamprey. Lampreys and alewives came through man-made canals from the Atlantic Ocean. The alewives thrived because there weren't enough lake trout to eat them. The 1960s brought the great alewife die-offs, tens of millions of rotting fish washing ashore. The effects on tourism were obvious. By the 1980s, the zebra mussels appeared, hitching a ride in the big ships. The zebra mussel is a small mollusk that came in um, through ballast water, originated in Eurasia. They attach to hard surfaces, clogging pipes and crowding out native plants and animals. Zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Problematic? Yes. What are we going to do to get rid of them? Probably there is not a realistic strategy to do that. Laws are in place concerning ballast water, but they differ in each Great Lakes state. Critics say they're not strict enough. Among the stowaways expected soon, killer shrimp. Killer shrimp shred their prey. So they will attack something larger than themselves, shred it, and eat it. They are highly likely to become established in the Great Lakes, and if they become established in the Great Lakes, are highly likely to cause significant problems. Beyond the ballast water, there is another way invasive species get into the Great Lakes. Beware the northern snakehead, also called fishzilla or frankenfish. There are already infestations on the east coast. Those didn't come out of aquaculture, and they didn't come out of ships, and they didn't, you know, I mean, it was, Johnny got tired of his pet snakehead in his, in his aquarium, and he threw it out on the lake. It can breathe air and walk on land. Nobody wants to tell little Johnny he can't have fish, but, um, you know, that particular industry is, is wide open, very unregulated. Federal laws have been proposed restricting the importation of species dangerous to the Great Lakes, but don't expect anything to come out of Congress anytime soon. It comes down to personal responsibility. People, in, individuals have to make a decision that they're going to do the right thing. You going to do the right thing, yes or no? Now, this gives you a good idea of what the Great Lakes are up against and kicks off our conversation. We want to hear what you have to say, plus answer any questions you may have. So follow us on Twitter at Great Lakes Now, find us on Facebook, and get in on the conversation right now. You can also go to greatlakesnow.org for more information on our topic today. So let's start now with panel number one. It is moderated by Dr. Patrick Doran, the Director of Conservation Science at the Nature Conservancy in Michigan. Patrick? Thanks, Chrissy. That was a really great video and gave us a nice overview of aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes. And I think the thing to remember is it's not just an Asian carp thing. And so that really goes back into the history. It seems um, you really can't go a day without hearing something or reading something about aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes. Uh, just about a year ago, the Nature Conservancy commissioned Anderson Economic Group to do a study of the economic importance of aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes. And it's hundreds of millions of dollars a year that we spend in controlling um, aquatic invasive species and managing this issue. Uh, just a bit before Christmas, um, the University of Michigan and many partners, including the Nature Conservancy, released a study on mapping Great Lakes threats, and aquatic invasive species were a huge component of that mapping effort as well. And just yesterday, I had 
two um, articles go across my desk, one talking about loon die-offs in northern Michigan, northern Lake Michigan, that is linked to aquatic invasive species through a quite complex pathway. And another one actually a little bit further away in California, but talking about the vector of, of people um, dumping their pets and how those pets uh, are aquatic invasive species that end up in the coastal waters of California. So I'd like to get to my panel here and talk about some of these issues. Um, we have Paul Pachelski, who's with the um, state of Ohio. He's the Ohio Lake Erie Charter Boat Association. Uh, Dr. Hugh McIsaacs with the University of Windsor, faculty there. Catherine Buckner is president and counsel of the Great Lakes Industries. And um, Mark Gaden is the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. So kind of getting into these issues, I'd like to start with Hugh. We, we heard about it's not just Asian carp. How, how big is an issue? What's out there? What do we think here? Well, it's an enormous issue in the Great Lakes. Um, people like, uh, like me, I believe that it's the leading issue in the Great Lakes today. Uh, it's a global issue, though. Uh, many of the problems that we have in the Great Lakes originate from the Black Sea, uh, rivers in the Black Sea, and these species are being moved throughout Europe first, and then they get transshipped over to the Great Lakes. Uh, if we look at aquatic ecosystems throughout the world, San Francisco Bay, North Sea, Baltic Sea, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, Mediterranean Sea, all of them are being inundated with species that don't belong there. So it truly is a global issue. Uh, I think we have a better handle or we address it more than in many of these other aquatic ecosystems throughout the world. But it is a global problem. Uh, and it's not just aquatic ecosystems. Many of the terrestrial ecosystems in the United States California, Florida, and Hawaii, three truly biodiverse regions are, are under siege. So, Mark, we saw a little bit about lamprey in the video. Can you give us a little bit of history? Again, it's not anything just recent. We've had this problem for years, decades. Since. Yeah, the sea lamprey was probably the worst and the first of the uh, invaders to come into the Great Lakes or really to raise to people's consciousness about what a problem an invasive species can have. The lamprey is native to the Atlantic Ocean. But when uh, shipping canals like the Erie Canal um, was, were constructed, and then when the Welling Canal was renovated about 1920, the lamprey were able to get past Niagara Falls and invade the Great Lakes. By 1939, they were seen as far as Lake Superior. If you look at the literature from the time uh, and, and uh, talk to the people who have been around, the Great Lakes fishery really collapsed quite quickly after the sea lamprey invaded. Um, changed a way of life in the region. The lamprey attached to fish with a suction cup mouth, a ring with sharp teeth, and they literally drill a hole through the side of the scales and skin of the fish, feed on their blood and body fluids, wiped out the fishery, and as the lead-in video showed, had some ripple effects to the ecosystem as well. So the lamprey was really raised the consciousness of people about what an invader can do to the Great Lakes. So, Paul, you've been fishing on the Great Lakes for, for a few decades now. 30 when did, years. 30 years. So when did, when did you start seen things? When did your clients, your anglers, the folks you took out on the water? Probably the seen? first that we've seen of it was in the mid to late 80s. And it started with the white perch. Uh, we'd go out and catch these by the hundreds. You know, we'd tease that if you fell overboard, they were piranha and eat you down to the bone. Uh, within a few years, we started, you know, grabbing zebra mussels on our hooks and Next, it was gobies, but the progression seemed so quickly that it was almost shocking to us where these come from. We, we knew nothing about them. So you, where, where, where do they come from? Which, the white? Or either or, like where, what they, are some of the major They were all vectors? basically uh, Caspian, uh, Baltic area. Uh, they were all brought in through various methods. So how should we, what pathways should we concern? Can you tell us a little bit about well, the different if, pathways? Well, if you look at the history since the modern seaway uh, was opened in 1959, uh, we looked at that period up to the modern uh, time, and we can attribute 55% of the invaders that have established in the Great Lakes that we're aware of to ballast water discharges by transoceanic ships. Uh, that number is very conservative. It may actually be as high as 70%. So uh, shipping is a dominant vector that has brought these species into the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. But there yeah. are many others as well. Mark? Uh, yeah, there are other pathways too. And um, as Dr. McIsaac uh, said, the um, sort of especially since the opening of the seaway in the 50s, um, as a vector for ballast water, it got a lot of people's attention. But we have canals and waterways that uh, connect uh, geographically, historically disconnected ecosystems that cause issues. Uh, many of you know the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, for example, is a way to connect the Great Lakes and the Mississippi, potential conduit for Asian carp and other species uh, to come from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi or vice versa. Uh, there's also the trade of live organisms. Uh, people can import 
uh, organisms for the pet industry, for example, or for aquaculture purposes. Um, very little vetting or screening occurs um, before these species are brought in, and yet they could escape and cause problems in the wild. So, Catherine, you work with the Council of Industries. Can you tell us a little bit about the types of organizations you work with and where aquatic invasive species kind of enter into the conversation or the equation? Well, this is the biggest issue for industry. Our organization represents industries, and I like to say that make stuff in the Great Lakes and that are located either on the lakes or in the general region. And uh, particularly the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels can be a problem. And, and our industries often come here or have come here in the past because the availability of this water is important to the process that they have. So they actually will install pipes that pull water out of the lakes and most of the times return the water to the lakes. And these pipes and intake structures get clogged by these mussels to the point where, you know, a substantial amount of money is required to maintain the pipes to make sure the water continues to flow. So, for example, they, they have equipment that they can install to keep the muscles from clogging the pipes. But as a practical matter, what it often comes down to is sending people out there to literally <coughs> scrape them off the pipes and to clean it up. And we had an opportunity to talk recently with some of our members, and our members reported that they are still spending, after a couple decades of doing this, you know, anywhere from half a million to three quarters of a million dollars a year dealing with this issue um, if they're located right on the lakes and have the, the muscle contamination. So obviously there's an economic impact there to do do you see any kind of other impacts through the industry or how are people doing it or where does it enter again into their conversations with their buyers with their products and where the shipping industry where they're getting their products? Well, I think what's important and what we're starting to see more and more, and we're going to hear, I think, a number of times today that invasive species are really a significant issue. And businesses are more and more starting to listen, even businesses that don't have those direct costs because they're not necessarily pulling water from the lakes. Um, they're beginning to see that the invasive species issue can have a, a sort of a, an a impact on the region to an extent where maybe people are, are not, they're concerned that people won't be able to enjoy living here as much. The quality of life may in the future from some of these species may not be the same. And businesses are interested in, you know, key, key things like certainty and, and things like being able to attract talent and keep their employees happy. And more and more we're beginning to see that companies are concerned about how this issue over the long term can affect sort of the economic uh, viability of the region. Yeah, this, this issue of kind of certainty and expectation and be a little bit predictable in the future I think seems really important. So, so Paul, when, when you talk to your clients, when you take them out in the boats, what, what are they seeing change? Are they surprised by changes? Are, they, are things unpredictable for them as well? Well, I think fish populations are one of the biggest changes. Our fish population, especially in the western base of Lake Erie, has diminished significantly since the advent of the uh, late 80s where we had numbers that were for walleyes were up around 80 million and now we're down to 23 million. Uh, yellow perch population, especially in the wa uh, western basin, which is the shallowest areas, have also plummeted where there's uh, very little commercial fishing anymore, but there is still sport fishing. So those things have changed. I think in the way of fishermen, we have to be more aggressive, more on our game in order to ensure our clients mm -hmm. a good day of fishing. And fishing in, in western basin, uh, of Lake Erie or in, in Ohio portion of Lake Erie, which is just seven counties, is a $1.1 billion industry that accounts for over 20,000 full-time equivalency wow. jobs. So, and the tourist industry is $10.2 million, or billion dollars, I'm sorry. And, and that's a pretty good chunk of change that you got to worry about. So it's not just the uh, component of industry, but it's also the tourist industry that's really at risk. So what kind of changes are people seeing? You mentioned earlier when we were chatting just about some changes in size of fish or where things are located. Well, size of fish, clarity of water I think is a, a big determining factor. With the zebra and quagga mussels, they're a filter feeder that actually clears the water to a point to us that have been on the lake for a very long time. It's almost spooky. Uh, mm -hmm. As I alluded to earlier, we were uh, out in October, and actually in the western basin of Lake Erie, I saw the bottom in 22 feet of water. Right, that's not Lake he Erie. Healthy yeah. Lake Erie western basin water is three to five feet of visibility with a green, rich, organically based water. To see down on the reefs 22 feet was just something I have never seen in 30 years of professional fishing in a lot more years of fun fishing. So you, that can get confusing, right? Because some people might say, 
uh, you know, I can see 20 feet, that's great, clean water, Lake Erie, how wonderful. But then you hear in the news, oh, algal blooms, I can't see two inches into the water. Um, so it gets kind of confusing because there's, there's all these issues. So can you bring us back to the, the mechanistic so there, link to AIS? So there's two types of uh, algal blooms that we have to concern ourselves with. The first pertaining to the clear water is that there's a nuisance alga that grows in the Great Lakes called Clodophora. And Clodophora can be limited either by the amount of phosphorus in the water or by the amount of light. And if you have low light conditions, it restricts its growth. Now what we're seeing with the increased light penetration is that Clodophora can grow at greater depth and in greater quantities. And when it sloughs off after major storms in late summer, this stuff will come ashore and it's a tremendous problem for people that live in uh, coastal areas. It can affect the uh, value of real estate. I know when my daughter was young, we were uh, up in Traverse City um, and beautiful beaches up there and she didn't want to go in the water because when she had to step out in the water there was clodophora growth and she didn't like the feel of it between mm -hmm. her toes. So it really does affect the quality of life for people, uh, but that's the first one and that's due to increased light transmittance. In Western Lake Erie we have a different problem. We have one where we have massive cyanobacteria blooms that appear to be related to two or three factors including the presence of uh, zebra and quagga mussels. Uh, we have massive amounts of phosphorus that will inflow into the uh, western basin, mainly from uh, Ohio tributaries. Uh, this phosphorus flows into the lake and is utilized by uh, the cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria, in turn, are not consumed by zebra and quagga mussels when they're typically feeding out in the lake. They're stripping out the nutritious algae and they're spitting this stuff back out, which allows it to form these massive blooms. Uh, so that's an ongoing problem, and it's a very severe problem for water quality in western Lake Erie. Yeah. And it's a little frightening, too, how history is repeating itself, too. Uh, you remember the, uh, the lamprey alewife lake trout dynamic where the lamprey had wiped out the top predators, leaving uh, too many alewives in the lakes that would um, then wash up on the beaches in large, uh, stinking masses that they literally would have to bury with backhoes uh, on the beaches because there were just so many of them. Uh, today we have these uh, Clodophora uh, the windrows uh, as well on the beaches that, that uh, create sort of the same situation that Alewife did, and that is um, it's, a, it's a coastal area that um, is, is not attractive, it's smelly, uh, it, it has a, a, a negative effect on tourism and the quality of life issues that uh, we've already talked about. These are exactly the issues that I was mentioning. Um, as we want to attract investment into the region and companies into the region, one of the big draws to this region is the recreational opportunities, the beaches, the waters. And that's important to, to all of us that live in the region and also to industry as, as they consider coming here or developing and building their facilities here. And it, it seems like I, I've read a number of things that younger people are not just looking for a job to go to, they're looking for a place to go live and settle. It's and, becoming and more and more important to, uh, to employers to be able to offer a positive employee, uh, a positive region for their employees to join. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because my kids love to go to the beach. Uh, sometimes we go to Florida. We love to look for shells. And I, we're up in Lake Erie, in a small town. I grew up in Conneaut, Ohio, um, just recently. And they look at all the, the, the mussel shells and like, oh wow, look at all these shells, Dad. But it is. It's just that repeating. It was alewife. It's clodophora. It's, it's zebra mussels on the shore. And again, it, it, it does impact your enjoyment. I'd rather walk on the sand than zebra mussel <laughs> shells. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so again, I, I really like that introductory video because it talked about a little bit about the past and lamprey and alewife, it, but it also then talked about the present and Asian carp. So can you tell us a little bit about Asian carp and the pathway and the impacts there, Hugh? Well, the Asian carp were uh, two species. The uh, silver carp and big head carp were initially brought into aquaculture in the southern United States adjacent to the Mississippi River. Uh, they were brought in to clarify uh, ponds that were being used to grow, grow other fish species. During a large storm, uh, it's believed that the fish were able to escape and enter into the Mississippi. Sw and they then swam up the Mississippi and, uh, as you can see from videos, they can achieve enormous population densities in areas uh, in uh, the upper Mississippi. Uh, and you can have large numbers of these silver carp that uh, will jump out and uh, potentially injure people that are uh, out boating or, or jet skiing. Uh, but they clearly dominate that system. The threat, of course, is that they can come into the Great Lakes. Uh, there is a second major pathway which would allow them to come in and that they used to be sold live in food stores. Uh, and uh, in both the Great Lakes states and in Ontario, we have bans, uh, uh, laws in place uh, against either uh, 
uh, possessing live Asian carp or moving live Asian carp. So we've tried to close that pathway, but we still have the open one uh, adjacent to the city of Chicago that people are concerned about. So, Paul, I'm sure you've had some Asian carp discussions on some uh, trips out in the water this summer. Quite what often. Are, what are it's people, what are they saying? What are your, what are your clients it's asking? It's the biggest buzz going on right now. What worries me, uh, the clients are, 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 of course, concerned because everybody knows that Lake Erie is really ground zero. Western base of Lake Erie is most organically rich of all the Great Lakes. And the two rivers that come into the Western Basin, the Sandusky and the Maumee River, have been identified as two of the rivers of major concern that if they did get in here, the reproduction can be here. Mm. Uh, one of the other pathways that isn't always brought up is Eagle Marsh uh, up around Fort Wayne. Those fish are poised to get in there and right now the Corps of Engineers has a chain link fence that blocks the two watersheds in case of floods. I'm not overly impressed with a chain link fence, but that's what they got. Um, but if it does get in Lake Erie, you know, it, it's already, we have the zebra mussels and quagga mussels already attacking our food chain from the lower limits. Now you bring in a plankton and filter feeder, uh, uh, much similar to the zebra and quagga, that's able to feed on the upper nutrient rich water that is still in Lake Erie. All of a sudden, now you're straining out uh, portions of life that it has kept Lake Erie alive or, or with our walleye and perch population that is of considerable value. And, you know, you look at other Great Lakes such as Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and those, those lakes are actually getting strained of life. Uh, the salmon species that were back in the 80s would grow to 30 pounds in four years if you get a 12 to 15 pounder now, you're quite proud of them. So it's affected the growth rate of those salmon and it will affect our commercial and sport fishing industry in Lake Erie also. So it's interesting, Mark, are people getting just to expect it? I mean, if I went from, it might be one personal experience, if I went from catching 30 pound salmon and a decade later I was catching 15, but if I'm just starting today and I'm catching 15 pound salmon, I just might be happy. Our people, and, and you mentioned in the video, you know, we have, we have good control for quite a, a couple species, but are people accepting? Is it just a matter of fact that we have to deal with some of these things? I should hope not, because you shouldn't have to settle for that. We don't have to um, settle for that. We know how these species are coming into the Great Lakes. It's uh, the ballast, the canals and waterways, and the trade of live organisms. So that tells me it's a solvable problem. Uh, you deal with the ballast issue, um, making sure that the um, ballast water is treated or um, better yet, not dumped in the first place if that's possible. Uh, you deal with the canals by um, separating um, watersheds that should be separate, that naturally were separate, and don't allow that pathway to exist. And you deal with the trade of organisms by being at least a little circumspect before you in import something and thinking about what kind of invasiveness this might have. Um, but, you know, what you end up with if you... Um, become complacent is uh, similar to your garden if you ignore it you end up with weeds and we don't want that in the Great Lakes Basin. I'll take the uh, trout and the salmon and the walleye and the um, perch any day that are native to the system uh, versus the uh, organisms that are threatening the system like Asian carp. So Catherine, do you yeah. see that in the industry? Are people is, is it just a uh, cost of business now? Do you think, do you think there's, there's complacency there? Well, I, I don't think it's complacency because I think industry realizes that these are big issues and it's hard to miss the drama, for example, of the Asian carp that we see on the videos and we've heard about. But it is becoming a, a cost in the sense that it formerly, a couple decades ago, was an extraordinary cost the business had to incur in order to deal with these issues. And more and more, it's just becoming absorbed into the maintenance budget or the um, repair budget and not as, and isn't considered as often an extraordinary cost. So in, in a sense, I don't think complacency is part of it, but it is sort of becoming a fact of business in the Great Lakes, perhaps, at least on the zebra and quagga mussels issue for some of the clients that are located so close to the water. And do you, do you see it hitting certain part of the industries versus others? Or? Well, it definitely has, as I've said, an impact on the industries that rely on water for processor cooling or something. Um, so the electric power generation industry, uh, refineries, and some of the other industries that have that are located on the lakes and are here to take advantage of this resource are particularly affected. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess also uh, municipally, I mean, again, we have the municipal 
water, but we also, what are the issues that towns and cities are dealing with too? Well, I, I'm not a municipal expert, but I can say that I've been in enough meetings with uh, mayors and others who've said that, you know, they invest in beaches, they invest in lakefront access, and then they have issues related to invasive species and, and other issues related to the Great Lakes that, um, that make those newly invested in and attractive features less appealing to the people who live in their municipalities. And of course, municipalities also have water intake structures similar to industry for drinking water and other purposes and have to deal with the costs associated with the mussels. Yeah. Um, now Paul, one pathway we haven't talked a little bit about or, or much about at all is the kind of the trailer boats and, and you obviously deal with a lot of boats and, and people that are Yeah, I was hoping that boat. would come up because I see different pathways. There are some very large pathways but you know you watch these zebra, quagga mussels, gobies, they're getting into other watersheds. I mean other small lakes they have no connection, no physical connection to Lake Erie or any other Great Lake. And trailered boats, you know, uh, we all have to take some responsibilities as individuals. Uh, people are going out taking, going buying minnows and at times, uh, you have to get non-native males to go out perch fishing. It's a responsible person that takes those back to shore and dumps them on land versus dumping them out on the, in the lake. You think you're doing a good thing. Uh, having an aquarium and you're tired of your fish and you want to get rid of them. Dumping them into a river, a creek, thinking, well, at least I didn't kill them. Uh, uh, boats, uh, just rinsing your boat changing your water out, uh, washing your bottom down so you don't take these invasive species. These are all small steps, but these are the pathways that a lot of these invasives have gotten into smaller uh, either man-made lakes or natural lakes because of the natural portability. Uh, people will actually, gobies have become a rather uh, good uh, bait for fish. They're realizing that smallmouth bass feed probably 60 to 70 percent on these invasive gobies. So people are getting the bright idea, well if they like them here, maybe I could try them in my favorite little lake and they actually take them with me. That's, that's probably one of the worst nightmares that I think biologists are looking at is the natural or, or people thinking, well, I'm just going to try it over here and see what happens. And the transportation is really a threat. That's what you said earlier, Hugh. I, I saw a study um, about a year ago that was doing in, um, surveys of people out in Nevada that were, that were bringing their boats to some lakes to go fishing. And they saw that they had people coming from the Midwest within the past week. Their boat was someplace in the Midwest, and then a week later it was someplace out in Nevada. I mean, these aren't just a Great Lakes issue and what's coming to the Great Lakes. It's what is going outward. For the spring fishery, I'm sorry, for the spring fishery in May, uh, April in the Maumee River, you'll see license plates from everywhere from Iowa oh, wow. to uh, Canada. I mean, they come all over for this. And they come in their boats. They, they bring their, their stuff, their waders. I mean, all these could be conduits. So there was a, uh, a study done looking at uh, people taking recreational boats out of the Great Lakes and where mm -hmm. they were going. And just at the time that this uh, University of Notre Dame study was published, uh, that very week they had the first report of uh, quagga mussels down in uh, the Hoover Dam. Uh, and as it turns out, the study had predicted that Lake Mead was the most vulnerable water body in the western United States to zebra mussels uh, because of the amount of boat traffic. And it's truly remarkable because I looked at it as a bird flies, it's 2,500 kilometers. Uh, sorry, I don't know how many miles that is, but it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the fact that you're taking a trailered boat through yeah. desert environment, yet these animals were still surviving. Uh, so uh, that was very unfortunate because there was a lot of effort to try and prevent the animals from getting across the Continental Divide. Once they got across the Continental Divide, they moved down. They're now in Southern California. Uh, the zebra mussel, its cousin, uh, is in Colorado and it was found in reservoirs. We don't know how it got into reservoirs around San Francisco. But once they made these beachheads into major bodies like Lake Mead, which is the busiest water body in the western U.S., all of a sudden that becomes, instead of a destination, that's now the source and the species is going to spread. And there's tremendous concern about the species moving all the way up into Washington State, Oregon. Uh, they have uh, boats that have been intercepted that were going to British Columbia with zebra mussels, uh, quagga mussels attached to them. 
So what initially was just our problem here in the Great Lakes is now a Western problem. But going back to the trailered boats, it's not, they can either attach to the boat or the motor. Uh, but in many other cases, for people that are out on Lake St. Clair, what you'll find is we have all kinds of macrophytes, uh, aquatic plants that are stranded near the marina areas. And when you put your trailer down in the water and pull the, your boat out, you'll often see large numbers of plants that are attached to your boat trailer. And if you, many of those plants are not native plants, they're alien species as well. And so if you were to go to another lake, you could potentially introduce not only the plant, but many of those plants are covered with zebra and quagga mussels. And so you're going to introduce a whole array of species into that lake when you go to a new system. So people have a responsibility to make sure that their boats and their trailers are clean before they go to new systems. And to give you an idea, of too, of what a national and, I guess, a North American-wide problem this is, uh, in all of the work that's been going on to look at the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, uh, the Asian carp, uh, primary Asian carp vector, uh, there was a study done uh, that uh, Notre Dame University did, I believe, for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that concluded that this is a two-way street. Um, there are about 10 species that um, are of severe threat from the Mississippi Basin to the Great Lakes. 29 species uh, are a threat f going from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi Basin, and then, as Dr. McIsaac suggested, uh, potential to spread throughout the continent. So this is a, you know, this is a, a national, international problem. Um, and a species coming into one part has a potential to spread all over. So, Catherine, when, when you go to your trade association meetings or your national conferences, do you see people looking at you like, hey, you're one of those Great Lakes people? <laughs> um, or, I mean, do the, are, is, is that conversation there? Are they asking you questions about how your industries are dealing with it? Are they, is that conversation happening? To some extent. Um, and, you know, as I said, there are some industries, a, a few industry sectors that are very affected directly by these things. And other industries that have a forward-looking uh, strategy that are affected in the more ambient sense of the damage to the, the region. Um, you know, there are a lot of stressors on the Great Lakes, and industries involved in some of those stressors and others, you know, and, and, and invasive species is in the <coughs> array of stressors that interests mm -hmm. virtually everyone in the region, but there are many, many stressors that demand attention and resources. I think that's important because we're looking at one issue here, right, but right. there's all kinds of interactions with algal blooms, with changes in water levels or warming waters as mm -hmm. well. Um, so, so you did mention kind of looking forward. When you get back to again, the, the, the industry um, perspective, how do people look forward? Are they, are they building their plans? Are they thinking about it in terms of their costs, controls, technologies, tools? It's hard to generalize across all of, across sure. all of industry in the region. I think some companies are thinking of these issues as uh, an integral part of their, their forward strategy and their future mm -hmm. thinking. And perhaps even uh, predicting direct costs or indirect costs associated with dealing with some of these issues. Um, investment decisions rely to some extent on some of these issues as well, as I mentioned before, as the Great Lakes is an attractive um, place for people to live and work, and, and I think industry is interested in keeping it that way. So all of these factors, you know, go into these strategies. Some companies are more involved on different issues than others. You know, mm -hmm. some that are directly involved will be very involved, or directly impacted will be very involved, and others are interested more on a monitoring level. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's a wide array of responses to these types of issues. So, Hugh, what, what, what should we be looking out for? What, I mean, again, that video was nice kind of yesterday and today, but it's tomorrow as well. Yeah, I, I'm still concerned about the Asian carp, and there's a lot of money, uh, an enormous amount of money being spent to try and prevent them from coming in. Uh, the things that I'm concerned about are pond and aquarium trades. Uh, we are, we're tracking two uh, tropical plants, water hyacinth and water lettuce, that shouldn't be in the Great Lakes, but we see them in multiple years in the same locations. And so we don't think that they survive the winters, which regulators were concerned with. But we think that at least one of the species is reproducing, uh, pr producing viable seeds that germinate the following spring. So some of these plants that are people like to stock into their ponds, uh, we know because uh, when we were doing our surveys this past summer, we found two different individuals who, cl who admitted uh, one had created a boom up near uh, uh, on Lake St. Clair. Uh, and he created a boom to contain water hyacinth that he was growing. Uh, and he actually told us that he had stocked them into there. Uh, in, in another location, we had both water hyacinth and water lettuce. Uh, so these are plants that have no business being in the Great Lakes. Uh, people, when their ponds get too full with these things, uh, they reproduce prolifically. They'll take some of the plants and they just throw them in the creek behind their house and the things end up floating downriver and into the Great Lakes. 
So I'm concerned about that, and I'm concerned about uh, Laker uh, vessels that uh, transit from the Great Lakes down into the St. Lawrence River uh, and pick up ballast water in the St. Lawrence River and then bring it back into the Great Lakes and discharge it. They could either be bringing in species that are non-native to the Great Lakes but are native to those areas, or they could be bringing in alien species from those areas and bringing them into the Great Lakes. And presently, those vessels are not regulated. So, Mark, what do you what do you see looking forward? What are you worried about? What do you what do you potential any new impacts? What are you thinking? I'm worried about the three vectors and whether we've adequately addressed all of those. And the ballast water uh, vector, uh, particularly from foreign ships bringing them uh, from from uh, foreign ports, as globalization increases, we can expect to see the uh, pressure to continue. And so, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, U.S. Coast Guard, has um, some ballast water regulations that are going to go into effect in the coming years that uh, adopt an international uh, treaty standard for ballast water. Is it enough? Uh, many people do not think it's enough that technology could improve to, um, uh, to drive that threat or the uh, risk uh, closer to zero for new introductions. So I'd like to see um, that uh, technology be um, improved and, and applied to those vessels on a continuing basis. On the uh, Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal and other canals and waterways, um, we have the good news is that there's a lot of coordination going on and, and, and funds being spent now to uh, bolster that um, uh, response to the Asian carp. There's an electrical barrier on the canal and they're looking um, very seriously at how to separate. Mm -hmm. um, could be costly, could be way off into the future, so the speed of that is something of, of deep concern. The trade of live organisms is still a free-for-all on what you can import. There's no screening process that uh, exists before you bring something into the country. Um, the border um, guards, uh, say, going over into Canada, they understand the Asian carp because they ask me when they right. know I work for the Fishery Commission if I, if I have Asian carp or know about Asian carp. And they've done a great job intercepting recently um, Asian carp shipments that were illegal. But on the other hand, if, you, if I were to, say, bring in something else, there's no screening that occurs to determine whether it's invasive and therefore uh, it leaves our waters at tremendous risk. There's legislation that was introduced in the last Congress by... Um, Congresswoman Slaughter and Senator Gillibrand that uh, I hope would pass in the new Congress to deal sure. with that. So Paul, it, it seems like you're right at the, the forefront of you, you, you know the science, you know the practice, you know the fisheries, but you're also dealing with the people. Is there a recognition? Is there oh, yes, a reluctance? There is. Do you see I, attention? I think what everybody sees as the bo biggest boogeyman is the Asian carp, you know, mm -hmm. um, as, as being probably the worst <coughs> conceived threat to our lake. And I often wonder, you know, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was originally the electrical fence, uh, the electrical uh, repellent that they put in the Chicago Canal was originally put in there to stop the round goby. That didn't work out very well. You know, the other threat that really worries me is the, the lower lake levels. I read the other day that if Lake Michigan gets six inches lower in water levels, that there'll be a flow reversal of the sanitary canal where it will no longer flow into the Mississippi but will reverse its flow into Lake Michigan. Right now I feel like it's the, the clear water of Lake Michigan more than the electronic barrier that stops those Asian carp. So we just have a couple minutes left. So what don't people realize? So each of you, kind of what, what are people not thinking about that you really like to make sure that we know? And again, the general public. The permanence of invasive species once they get into the system and why we need to focus like a laser beam on prevention because once they get here and they make the Great Lakes their home, they're here to stay, eradication is impossible and control, if you're very lucky, you'll be able to achieve that. But we only yeah. do it with lamprey and alewife. So Catherine, what, from the industry perspective, what, what don't people see? What do they not realize? Well, I would, what I would hope the public would realize is that there isn't a magic bullet for any of the species or any of the vectors. And it's going to require an overall systemic approach to sort of preventing their uh, entry into the system and then doing what we can to manage them once they're here. And it's not just any one solution. It's not, not industry one solution. solution. It's not no a magic bullet. NGO solution. It's not a governmental solution. We all have to work together. Exactly. You, what do you think? What do people not see? If we're successful in uh, eliminating the vector of uh, transcontinental ships bringing species into the Great Lakes, and I think we're getting close, uh, then we have to pay attention to all of these alternative vectors, and Mark mentioned a bunch of them. Uh, people have a role to play, a vital role to play in both spreading these species and preventing their spread. So uh, uh, that would be my, my, my chief uh, concern. Yeah. 
Hi, well, thanks, panel. I, obviously, this is a very real, it's an ongoing issue, um, and it may seem overwhelming, it may seem a little depressing at times, <laughs> but our next panel is going to talk about some solutions. But right now, we have some time to take a number of questions from our audience here. Hi. Um, so being a researcher, um, down, I'm from Wayne State University. I'm a student uh, down there. And I study the Great Lakes. And while being down there, uh, I get to see a lot of the industry and everything that, that is spotted along the Detroit River. And my main question to you is to Catherine. Um, what kinds of mitigation and restoration efforts are supported by the Council of Great Lakes Industries? And also, what kinds of policies do you guys recommend or support? Well. Getting into solutions would be a little bit out of the scope of this panel, but we um, support, as we've sort of just concluded with, multi-stakeholder um, approaches to uh, assessing the risks and hazards of the species on an individual basis uh, so that we don't take, um, you know, the shotgun approach if something more specific would be appropriate. Um, industry is in favor of doing as many risk analyses as we can without trying, without getting bogged down in analysis, and also making sure that the resources are wisely applied so that we can, you know, get as many um, risks reduced as possible with the limited resources that we have in the basin, both publicly and in a private sector. Mm. Next question. Uh, taking this issue to rivers, a lot of the rivers feeding into the Great Lakes, um, dam removal has been an effective tool to restore rivers and habitat, uh, yet dams also serve as a barrier for the transportation and a vector of invasive species. So how do you balance these two strategies? Mark, I could take that or you can... You Why can don't you start? And, uh, um, one thing we are doing right now is, again, dams and barriers and barrier removals are, are a big issue. And it's, it's not just dams, but it's also road stream crossings that, pretend, that are oftentimes barriers. Um, one thing we're doing is, is we have a paper coming out that's actually mapping all of the extent of the issue around the Great Lakes, but not just that, trying to um, look at where you can get the most bang for your buck on opening up or restoring connectivity. But I think the most important thing there is you have to balance all these costs and benefits. On a, a cost side, you have, you're potentially opening up more habitat for aquatic invasive species, like lamprey, corresponding habitat for a variety of things, or contaminants passing. But on the, the benefit side, you're opening up habitat for some species we like to fish for, we'd like to watch, we'd like to see, we'd like to know. So we're actually doing this type of analysis that really will look at those potential costs and benefits, because if we don't do that full cost accounting, you might end up a problem either way. And I would add uh, that it's worth a conversation, because dam removal uh, in many cases has tremendous benefits. but. As the question alluded to, too, sometimes these dams are the only thing protecting the upstream from invasive species and also then the effect on the lake. If you open up more streams for sea lamprey, for example, it's going to have an effect on the Great Lakes fishery and the economics that that fishery brings. We can do dam removal. Uh, we can employ technologies that might um, allow you to pass fish and also block lamprey, but we need to have a conversation before the dam is just automatically removed. Next question. I work with the state of Michigan with the Office of the Great Lakes, and one of the questions that repeatedly comes up um, as we move ahead with the political will to take action uh, has to do with the cost of invasive species. And I'm particularly interested in um, a panel's ideas on the cost of invasive species for the recreational side of the Great Lakes. So any thoughts you have on that would be really useful. Paul, are you seeing a hit to um, some of the recreational aspects? I, over the, the past 12 years, we went First off, let me preface it, uh, Lake Erie it has the largest charter boat fleet on the Great Lakes. We went uh, from 12 years ago from over 1,200 licensed charter boat captains now to down to 768, I think is the current number. So that is a hit uh, that we've taken. Uh, I think uh, there are different aspects of ecotourism that have flourished because of some of these. Uh, birding and, and uh, things have, have developed. But as an industry, we are taking a hit. And you can look at 12 years ago, you had a hard time finding a dock on Lake Erie. Now, there's no standing in line for them anymore. You want a dock, you know, you could go to virtually any marina you want. And the, uh, the boating has taken a big hit. So uh, just to remind everybody, we're also online and on Twitter. And we do have one question from Twitter from Tom Cook. 
It says the Great Lakes face a number of challenges, climate change, toxics, pollutants, runoff, aquatic invasive species, amongst others. And I, I mentioned that study that recently came out mapping the stressors of the Great Lakes. Um, how great is the relative threat of AIS is what Tom's asking. And Catherine, you mentioned earlier, you know, industry thinks about a lot of stressors. AIS is one of them. Right. What's the relative importance? It is important. And again, I have to distinguish between companies that are directly affected, to which this is a critical issue, and companies that are not directly affected because they're not drawing water from the lakes, which is which makes this an important issue, but not necessarily a bottom line issue. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the industry, it depends on the facility, and it depends on the circumstances. I hate to right. say that, but it's true. <laughs> what do you think, Hugh? I mean, uh, again, you, you, you study AIS, um, and obviously it's the most important thing out there to study, but uh, how do you look at all these other stressors? I'd say uh, aquatic invasive species and climate change are the two uh, leading threats today. And they're not uh, independent of one another. And again, all these stresses are not independent of one another. No, of course not. Uh, if we have warmer conditions than those plants that I mentioned, they're native to Brazil. Uh, they may actually survive winters that they can't survive right now. Mm -hmm. uh, asking a question like that is a little bit unfair because when you look at other issues like mercury pollution in the basin, which are, to me, just an enormous concern uh, that has to be addressed, it, I, I'm willing to prioritize them, but sure. I think they're all important issues. And, and the end point is important. Some are hu human health concerns, some are fisheries concerns, recreational, and some are our industry and tourism. Mm -hmm. And they all, again, are, 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 are dependent upon one another. They all interact with one another, which is a whole different set of questions. Um, another question from the audience. Yes, I'm with Michigan Sea Grant, and I would like the panel to speak to the importance of public outreach about invasive species. Programs like this are great, and I think we need to do more of it, and I'd like to hear your opinion about it. Why don't we go along the line? Go ahead, Matt. Well, public outreach, uh, as a few of the panelists have talked about, especially with the transportation of invasive species, is something that's part of the uh, solution. So it's very important for uh, agencies uh, like the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and Sea Grant and others to uh, continue to interact with the, with the people that could have an effect. It also has um, a legislative effect. Getting the attention of elected officials to try and do something about invasive species is a challenge. Uh, the Asian carp has probably done more to um, uh, provide sort of an in-your-face uh, example of an invasive species and has moved the bar quite a bit on getting the attention of legislators. But uh, the people of the Great Lakes Basin don't have to stand for these kinds of um, invasions and the economic harms that they cause. So that public education is a reminder um, to um, get involved and to, um, to remind your elected officials to, to uh, help with the solution. Do you see more common discussions? I mean, do you see it when you're out there among the legislators? Because, certainly because of Asian carp. It's gotten the attention of not only the public but also the uh, legislators like nothing I've seen. The lamprey is probably as close as it comes to uh, um, have gotten the attention as well. But the Asian carp has really mobilized people because it's big and charismatic and it literally hits you in the face uh, if you're out on the river. <laughs> it's hard to miss it. <laughs> Catherine, do you see your members or constituents uh, doing any kind of outreach education? Do they have materials going out to their customers? Uh, to some extent, um, it can be an issue in public outreach from corporations, although that's not really often a corporate focus. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's true that public outreach is essential here. And the reason for that is whether, you know, I sort of believe that these issues always come down to people, whether it's people in government or people in business or people in, on the street and people with Aquaria. Um, it's very important for everyone to be aware of these issues because of the complexity of the system, the multiplicity of the stressors, and the, the solutions that are being developed are substantial solutions that are going to take resources. So I think public outreach is critical. And do you see people reacting to the costs getting passed down to the customer, like in the power industry? And Is that happening? Uh, I haven't seen that yeah. directly, no. Yeah. So Hugh, um, obviously you're on the academic side of it, but being involved in this topic, you're at the forefront of interacting with, with people as well. I am, and public. I'm familiar with a lot of the programs that are run in various states. The Sea Grant programs, in my opinion, are simply invaluable. Uh, they provide a great service to the public. Uh, some of the states, Wisconsin, uh, extreme, Minnesota, extremely active in trying to educate the public on uh, the issue of uh, alien species and, and how they can prevent these species from uh, getting into their systems. Mm -hmm. And do you see any adverse reaction when you talk to people at all? I'll or tell you, all, what uh, do I, do? I have to agree with you. We're very fortunate to have an active Sea Grant in Ohio. I work with Dr. Reuter a lot. And they have a conference for the charter boat captains, and we have participation of 250, 275 charter boat captains that come and get the information, and we are a conduit to our customers out there. And most of us 
<clears throat> that are responsible are talking about invasive species, are talking about water quality, and what we as individuals could do. But that information, uh, we have found that the best pathway has been uh, sea grants, yes. and that's a very important program. And it seems when you're actually out in the water, out in the place, it's people really, are listening. It smacks you in the face, yeah. and, and people are listening. Well, there's questions. Yeah. They have questions. People see something like that blue-green algae, right. or they see a goby, or they see a zebra mussel. They have questions, and it's important for us, anybody out on the water, to be as knowledgeable as possible. And yeah, nothing, nothing um, replaces that firsthand experience. No. Well, thank you all. That was a great discussion. I learned a lot, and I hope everybody out there learned a lot as well.